here on the show. In the smaller markets, often the, the talent or the or the uh, the host of the show will make that decision. But you can pick up the phone and call those people up and say, hey, you know, um, here's who I am. Here's the the work that I do. I'd really like to come on and talk to you one day about about how to pick a good pet. You know, how to make a, a, a good pet selection for your family or, or what to do if you bought a pet and it's not working out or, um, you know, how to train a pet to do the things that you need to do or if you're in the medical research community like Larry, uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, you know, some of the things, exciting things that are going on right now in biomedical research and how it's going to benefit human and animal life. So you can position yourself as an expert and you can pick up the phone and call those people and like as not, you're going to get on that show because they're always looking for talent. They're always looking for an interesting half hour or hour to spend on your issue. Now one of the things that Larry can tell you about, probably better than anybody in this room, is the downside of being the high profile spokesperson for a controversial uh, animal use business like biomedical research. Because Larry is one of those people that has been on the receiving end of a lot of harassment and a lot of bullying, and I, one of the things I love so much about him is that he's always stood up and gone chin to chin and never backed off an inch, and that is something that I think is so terrific and so valuable. Larry, I, I bow to you for that. And, and when Patty asked him to, to join the National Animal Interest Alliance, and he was already kind of on the hot seat anyway because he was very vocal in the research community, and to take on the additional responsibility of speaking out for a major national animal use organization that goes beyond research, that's really a commitment. And, and we need, gosh, we, we just need so many more people that have the, the cojones, if you pardon the expression, <laughs> to do that. So I, hats off to you. Um, so, so realize that the more you become a public person on this issue, the more you probably are going to be a little bit of a target. And in your local communities, particularly if you live in larger metro areas, you know, you may be subject to a little harassment, and that's tough to take. When my home address appeared on the Animal Liberation Front website, along with instructions on how to set fire to my house, I was a little unnerved by it. Fortunately, I had moved. So, <laughs> so I'm not sure who took over the house after I left, but I didn't read that it was burned to the ground, so I'm assuming that they dodged the bullet. Um, but, but it does take some courage and recognize that you are setting yourself, to some extent, um, for a little bit of exposure. But if you're, if you're preaching a responsible message, um, a message that really provides a public service, which in many, in many cases we're going to be doing, then you should have nothing to fear and um, you, should, you should really welcome those opportunities. One of the great things about radio call-in shows, and Larry and I were talking about this earlier, is that you can wire them up so that you really wind up having most of the time. Now, sometimes you'll be on those programs alone, and that's great. If you manage a, if you manage a solo shot, that's the best, because there really isn't going to be anybody competing with you for attention except for the moderator or the host. But every now and then, you'll be part of a show, and they bring on somebody else from the other side, whoever that might be, and they say, okay, we're going to do a little debate here. And you want your people to call in. You don't want your people asking the other guy questions. Why is that? They get the time. That's right. That's right. You want your people calling in, giving you questions so that you can speak on your positions and your issues, and you chew up time then that the other guy doesn't get to, to, to deliver his point of view. So don't think, oh, I got a really good question. I'm going to ask him, did you know that this guy was indicted? You know. That's not going to give you a lot of help because they're going to wind up chewing up the next 15 minutes explaining why that's not a problem and you're going to have basically wasted a good opportunity. So radio is great. You can control it easily. You can get on easily. And you can use it very effectively to deliver your message. Always remember, too, what Richard Earle was saying earlier. <coughs> Make sure that you don't ever let a radio opportunity go by without giving some call for action. Visit our website. You know, check into our website. Call us for more information. Call us to volunteer. If you like what we're doing, yeah, you might want to send a little check. That would be fine. But give them something that they can do if they're interested in your message and want more or want to get more engaged. Um, with radio, it's about sound. It's not about visuals. It's about how you sound. And some of us, if you've ever had the experience of listening to yourself on tape, you know how different you sound from the way you think you sound. And it's really important to learn how you actually sound um, so that you can work on the things that you need to work on to be a good radio voice. That means sometimes ratcheting down your pitch a little bit. Sometimes it means slowing down your rate of speech. 
When I'm nervous, I tend to talk really, really, really fast. And I remember one time when I was in high school and I was debating, and it was the last round, and I was really trying to get all my stuff in. And I was racing and racing and racing. And the judge finally just threw up her pencil in the air, and she said, why don't you just stop? I haven't heard a damn thing you've said for the last 10 minutes. So I kind of learned my lesson, and I, I worked hard to try to control that speech pattern and that speech rate. But those are the things that you need to worry about when you're on the radio, because people are going to judge you based on what they hear, they don't have the benefit of being able to read your lips or watch your expression. So you have to be able to sort of infuse your voice with the kind of warmth and openness and, and I am a really good person delivering this message. That kind of sense, so that people get a sense of who you are from the way you sound. Um, there, there, really are, there really are no rules um, for talk shows. That's kind of the good thing and the bad thing. The good thing is that you have a lot of flexibility and latitude in talk shows. The bad news is that people can call in and ask just about anything. And sometimes you get some really whack jobs that are completely clueless and, and, and may even go off into some area that you're not even talking about. Hopefully the moderator or the host is going to control that, but be prepared for anything. And sometimes if you get a really vitriolic person that just calls and says, you know, you are all a bunch of murderers, all you can say is, you know, you obviously have a strong impression, you know, opinion of your own. There's nothing I'm going to be able to do to change your mind. Yeah. yeah. But you know, don't don't try to argue with them. It's just there's just no point. Just say, well, obviously you've got to get made up. I'm not going to be able to change your mind. I would hope that more that most people would be a little more open and a little more reasonable. But you know, you're entitled to your opinion. Um, Sometimes, you know, if you're doing a regular radio interview, then the reporter is going to ask you questions that are relevant to the news, and that's okay, and you're going to deliver your message according to what we talk about later, according to how you define your messages. But like I said, with listeners, there's no hold bars. bars. One of the things that I think is really important is when you're, when you're doing a radio call-in, be sure that you write down the name of the person who is calling. The, the announcer will always say, you know, we've got Joe from Brooklyn Park with a question, and, and be sure to write that down, write his name down, write the nature of the question, so that when you answer it, you can say, Joe, I'm really glad you asked that question, because a lot of people have that same misunderstanding. Go ahead, David. Question? Yeah, in term, I, I've done radio interviews, but when somebody calls in with bad information, where did you get this information from? And it puts the onus back on them, and then you have the ability to set the record straight where they're inaccurate. That can work except for the fact that you give up a lot of time. You give up a lot of time letting the other person try to explain where they got this information. It might be a better approach just to say, I'm not sure you, where you got that information. I've never seen that statistic, but let me tell you about my understanding of those numbers. And then you go on and you present what your case is. Don't give the other guys too much time because you only have so much time. You might ask afterwards, you know, I really appreciate knowing the source of those numbers, why don't you email that to me, or, or um, you know, send me a send me a note because I'd like to check on those numbers myself. But don't open the door for somebody to chew up the next five minutes of the conversation talking about where they got numbers that are bad for you. Well, that that could come across as you're being evasive. They've got you, and you're running. No, not at all. I, I you know, you see this all the time in politics. Somebody will say, "I've never seen those numbers. I'm not sure where they come from. They may or may not be correct. I don't know. But here's what I do know. Here's what I do know." It you is their tactic to blindside you, so yeah. you have to be able to right. stay on Right, um, see, it's, yeah, it's, it's mission, about stay staying on. focused, right. yeah. staying on message. You don't want to get distracted. You can spend the next 10 minutes talking about whether the source of their information is credible or not credible. Is it recent? Is it not recent? How is the information gathered? Who cares? It's not really relevant to your message. Your message is, here's what I want you to know, and no matter how you try to distract me, I'm still going to tell it to you. I've always been taught you should answer the question you want to answer. Exactly. And we're just going to, just as soon as I finish up this little piece, we're going to talk about, about defining and focusing on your message. It's almost um, like Ronald Reagan when he said, I paid for this microphone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, politics is the perfect example of that. You know, politicians don't answer the question they're asked. They usually answer the question they want to answer. Sometimes it'll come back and bite them in the butt. But that's okay. They got their message out, and that reporter might be real aggravated that they didn't get a straight answer to the question, but they got out the message they wanted to get out. And more time than not, the reporter follows that new tack and goes off in that new direction right along with them. They're not going to stick around and wait.
waste time when they can see you're not going to answer that question. They're going to go in another direction. So, so you have a lot more control than you realize you have. So put the name down and, and, and speak to that person one-on-one. -on -one. Recognize that that person is an individual and try to address that person as an individual. Uh, be prepared for anything, maintain focus. Last thing, um, internet. And I feel myself to be ill-qualified to speak about the internet because being the technological dinosaur I am and, and sort of cruising toward retirement, um, with my little Blackberry and my, my MacBook Air, neither of which I can operate about half the time. Um, I know that I am not the world's best person to talk about technology, but I do know enough to know this. Websites, blogs, podcasts, listservs, the social networking um, sites like Facebook, YouTube, Dig, and so forth, these are tremendous resources and increasingly influential as news and information sources. So don't be hesitant about getting engaged in those activities online. You need to have a website, you need to participate in blogs. Um, I know in the Greyhound Racing community, for example, there are all kinds of blogs that are run by adoption groups. Some are friendly to the industry, or at least cooperative with the industry, some are very hostile. But we have people who, who work closely with us in the industry, who constantly are monitoring those blogs, and when they see bad information about something that's going on, they just step in and they correct it. And it's not an industry person doing that, it's just a friend who knows the facts because they communicate with the people in the Greyhound Racing community. So these are great opportunities and, and uh, please take maximum advantage out of them. I mean, you can have your own radio show doing it online. There is a, there is a weekly radio show on Greyhound adoption. There is a national, um, in fact, there are probably multiple sites where for a very small fee, you can do a podcast once a week and have radio guests and have all kinds of discussions and people can call in and it's just like downtown. You know, it's, 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 um, it's really a great way to get your message out. So there are young people, usually they're under 30. Uh, sometimes they're not, but most of them seem to be under 30, all the ones that really know how to do this stuff. You know, I mean, your kids can do it. <laughs> if you don't know how to do it, talk to your kids because the odds are they know how to do it. So the bottom line is do it because increasingly, that, there's no question that's the way they future. Okay. That is the PowerPoint part. Now, what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about message development and conducting effective interviews. And I'm not going to use the, um, the technology because I don't want to get distracted by the technology, which, as you can see, does sort of intimidate me. I don't like it. <laughs> so we're going to talk about defining your key messages. <laughs> the most important thing, you know, you can send out a news release in a format that doesn't really look professional. You can do a lot of things wrong but you can't afford to get your message wrong. If your message isn't right, if your message doesn't make sense, then all the communication that you, that you disseminate, no matter where and in what environment, is gonna be wasted. So it's really, really important to focus on your key messages and define those messages well. As you think about how to define your messages, and I recognize that there are a lot of people here from sort of different groups. I mean, you've got some pet breeders, you've got some medical research people, I think we've got some circus people, you've got some wildlife people. You all come from a lot of different avenues, so your messages are going to be different. But there are some basic messages that I think everybody has in common in this room. One is that we are responsible animal users. We are the people who care for animals. That's a really important message. We are the people who care for animals and care for them in a way that makes their lives better, as well as making the lives of people better. So we do things that benefit animals and people. That's a really important message, I think, for all animal use groups. Because when it comes to the discussion of that human-animal bond, and we know that this is really sort of the underlying agenda of the animal rights movement, it's about breaking that bond. It's about separating people from animals, having animals at a distance. As, as Ingrid Newkirk says, letting them be free to live their natural lives, not waiting at home for somebody to come home and fix dinner and watch TV. So, that's about, their message is about breaking that bond. Our message is about solidifying that bond, which is a benefit to both humans and animals. So think about this when you are crafting your message. What behavior or attitude change do you want people to undergo? What do you need them to do or to believe? What is the most important thing for them to know about what you do? Now, when Christine was talking about proactive messages, I thought, you know, that's really important because for so long, animal use groups have played defense. And Patty and I first got to know each other 
when we started to share our notes about how frustrated we were at always playing defense. And we said, you know, we have to find a way to shift this game. You know, the old saying in football is, if you're not moving the ball on them, they're moving the ball on you. There is no sitting still in this issue. You either got to be pushing forward or you're going to lose ground. So being out there, being proactive is important. Proactive, in my view, also means going on the attack when you have an opportunity to do so. And that's why I think this issue is different from uh, product marketing, for example. And, and Richard Earl spoke to this briefly earlier. He mentioned the difference between selling a product and selling an idea. The difference between a product and idea when it comes to this issue, this issue, it's like politics. In politics, any good candidate and any good campaign does two things. It positions the candidate and it repositions the opposition. That's why you don't hear any candidate only advertising nice, positive, fuzzy ads about what fine people they are. Because for every ad that Barack Obama runs, saying what a great guy Barack Obama is, He's going to run three ads saying that McCain isn't such a good guy and he doesn't have good ideas, and vice versa. It's not only about positioning yourself, it's about repositioning the opposition. This is a political war that we're engaged in, make no mistake. This is a political issue, it's a political war. It's not like product marketing, it's different. And so in the battle of hearts, you know, for the hearts and minds of people, we need to make sure that people understand who the opposition is as much as they understand who we are. And that's why I think that, that not only do I, do I agree completely that it's wrong and unproductive to play defense, my recommendation is we play offense. And our offense is partly good news about us, and it's partly bad news about the other guys. It's just that simple. So whenever I help my clients structure mes messages, I tell them, okay, here's what we want to do. We want to have three basic key messages that we promote. Two of them speak specifically to what good people we are in our industry and all the things that we do right. The third message is, this is not really about animal welfare. This is about a value system and an agenda that go far beyond animal welfare. And it's an agenda that is very dangerous for humans. And we don't ever send out one communication that doesn't address all three of those messages because it's almost always about repositioning the adversary as much as it is about positioning your own issue. So you're going to sit down and you're going to look at what is the one or two, what are the one or two things that you think people really need to know because you really want them to either change their behavior or change their attitude. Is it about making people go buy pets from purebred uh, pet breeders? If that's your goal, then you have to figure out what can I tell people that will enable them to come to me, that will convince them to come to me. Pure bed pet breeders produce the healthiest, best pets in the world. That's a simple message. Pure bed, I can't get that word out. <laughs> Pure bred pet breeders benefit consumers by offering a full choice. It expands the choices that consumers have in terms of how and, and where they want to get their pets. So it's a, it's a benefit. It expands consumer choice. That might be a message. But, but that third message is going to be the people who have an issue with us don't have an issue with us because they're concerned about animals. They have an issue that has to do with their own political agenda. And here's what that agenda is. Way back when I started working for the fur trade in 1989, and I do take credit for this. I, I can't take credit for much, but I do take credit for this. I think that when we put out our little brochure, it was entitled Animal Rights in the Words of Its Leaders, and it had strings and strings of quotes from the animal rights movement, from Ingrid Newkirk, Wayne Pacelli, um, just the whole, the whole list, you know, the usual suspects. And it was a whole long list. And I had, I, had, I had run into this with reporters. I would say, you don't understand what these people are really about. They'd say, oh, come on. Give me a break. The old conspiracy theory, you know, they think you've got, you know, foil antenna and, and you're getting, you know, communication, communications from Mars or your fillings. And um, so, you know, they'd be skeptical. And, and I'd say, look, you know, don't take my word for it. Here's the list of things that they've said. Here are the publications that they said it in, date, volume, publication, the whole nine yards. Look for yourself. 
Yeah, nine out of ten times these reporters would come back and they'd say, oh my God, I had no idea. So I let the animal rights movement speak for itself. And that's all you have to do, a lot of the times. All you have to do is just share this stuff and it really opens a reporter's eyes. So that's what we mean when we say always factor in information about that radical agenda so people understand it's not about animal welfare versus us. We're the animal welfare people. <coughs> they have another perspective. And remember what I said earlier about, you know, 10% of the people being on one end, 10% of the people being on the other end, that's 80% in the middle. That's who you're talking to when you say they are extreme, we are moderate, we are mainstream. You are really where we are. The average person, all you, all you people out there that own pets, you're with us. You may not recognize it, but you're with us. You're on our side. Well, one of the difficulties is uh, to define who the they is. In the case of AB 1634, the they that was against us was the California Veterinary Medical Association. Yeah. Now, you can't... They changed I, that, though. Oh, I know. They, 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 well, well, that was after a huge outpouring from our side, many organizations, including NAIA, and all, some private veterinarians that fought with us finally get the CBMA to remove their support and they went neutral. And, uh, but, so how, but it was very difficult for us because we don't want to criticize the Veterinary right. Medical right. Association. Were they, were they working with any of the animal rights groups? What they would know. What, uh, and that's often the case. We always think the animal rights people are behind all this legislation. They're not. It's a many, many different reasons for the legislature. It's not always HSUS or right. Right. based. Right. And in this case, it goes back to uh, a history of, of the veterinarians deciding to team up with the, the, um, the Humane um, Association and the Animal Control Association, and they made a decision, I'd say about seven or eight years ago, that it would be powerful if all three of them would always decide on whether they were going to support or oppose legislation. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty much automatic that all three, State Humane, Animal Control, California Animal Control Association, and the CDMA all came out for uh, the Healthy Pet Act, you know, which sounds very good. Right. Uh, but that put us in a very bad position, and the president of the CDMA was totally in support, and still is. Still is very Hasn't disappointed. Hasn't he signed on as an advisor to HSUS now? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think they are animal rights. Yeah. 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 Let, let, me, let me say, though, here's, here's what I would do in a situation like that. And you're right. And, and here's, here's, the, here's the real dilemma with that. In many respects, we rely on veterinary experts to back up our position on issues. So it's very awkward for us. We don't want to be in a position of attacking a veterinary association because ultimately we rely on veterinarians for a lot of the, for a lot of the uh, validity that we bring to the table and the credibility that we bring to the table. But it is appropriate to say we recognize what the CBMA is trying to do with this legislation. There may be, there may be positive intent behind it, but they're going about it the wrong way. And they perhaps have not thought through the implications and the impact that this is going to have on the average person. Yeah, I mean, there's a respectful way that you can say, you know, we rely on the veterinary community, we trust their judgment on animal issues, but sometimes when it comes to public policy issues, they may not be exactly on the right page. And in this case, we think they're wrong because their policy implications of this are really, really important. Well, we actually did was we mounted a campaign with individual veterinarians and really, truly let them see that their association was not representing their interests. And we let them take on their association. That's great. That's absolutely 100% the best way to do that. It was, it was great. And so that was a very interesting turn yep. of events until they finally went to the Board of Governors of the CDMA and threatened they were going to quit the organization. Most of them in their private practices had no idea what their association was doing. See, and that's the ideal outcome. Because you know what the, the long-term impact of that is? They're never going to get caught with their zippers down on that issue again. <laughs> They Tell never will. <laughs> yes. All right. I want to just clarify one thing what Joan was saying. The, the Board of Governors for the CBMA held in secret after the big convention in Anaheim. They did this in secret. It was only the small board. They did not let the members at all have any input. And that's when folks were shit in the fan. Right. <laughs> But I just want you to know that California vets are not really animal rights activists. No, of course.
course not. Because you think that they're biased. 
in all the years that I've been doing media on this issue, I honestly can say that I've only run into reporters that really had a strong personal bias maybe two or three times. Maybe two or three times. The rest of the time... Pardon? It's the Bob Barker syndrome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but you know, most of the time they come in and they say, well, here's what they say. What do you say? And then, you know, you deliver the message and they say, huh, well, that's interesting. And they try to do whatever they can do to present a relatively balanced report, given the parameters that we talked about earlier, because the unusual, the bad, usually gets more coverage than the usual, the good. So recognizing those constraints, they do the best they can. But it's really important to use your interview opportunities to deliver your messages, not theirs. So if somebody says to you, you know, what are the you know, what is the animal rights issue with what you do? Are you going to spend time repeating those animal rights arguments? No, sir. You're going to say, that's a good question. From my perspective, there's no issue because X message, Y message, Z message. And if they say, well, yeah, but what is the argument? You know, go to them, ask them. You know, from my perspective, here's my take on the situation. And so don't waste time repeating their messages. Use your time to focus on your message. As I say, when you get tough questions, it's really important not to flinch and not to back away from those questions. You've got to be prepared for those tough questions. And we're going to talk a little bit about preparation. But being prepared for those questions means taking that tough question and saying, I'm so glad you asked. It gives me an opportunity to, to answer a question that so many people have. There's such a misunderstanding out there about this. And then you answer that question. And you're not afraid of it, you welcome it. And as soon as you take that attitude, instead of being defensive and saying, you know, that's just not true. If it's, instead, when you turn that around, you say, I'm so glad you asked that question. It gives me an opportunity to really give you the facts. Then people say, well, I mean, she really jumped into that. She's obviously not afraid of that question. So there must not really be bad news there. So it's just all in how you respond to those negative questions. Turn them into positives. As I said before, you don't ever want to restate the, the negatives. You don't ever want to give more mileage to their position than your own. Um, I can only speak to my own views. I can't really tell you what their issues are. I can only speak to my perspective. And as you do that, that, that constant refocusing, you're always going to, it's like, it's like driving up a road when there are potholes. Okay? Now, those potholes are going to slow you down a little bit. Sometimes you're going to have to maybe go around them a little bit. But, you know, you don't hit a pothole and then decide to take a right turn. You know, because you don't want to get to your destination anymore because there's a pothole? No. You're going to keep going. And that's what you have to do. So when you have those potholes and when people throw you these curveballs, what you have to do is use what we call bridging techniques to get back to your message. So if somebody says to you, for example, um, you know, aren't you just contributing to this terrible pet overpopulation problem? You say, let's back up a minute. Do we really have a pet overpopulation problem or do we have a bad pet owner education program? Or, you know, do we have, as Patty said, you know, a pet retention problem or a pet destination problem or however you want to hang it. But, but the, 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 the key is to move from the question that they ask in a negative way to use a bridging technique to say, let's back up, let's put that issue in context. Let me, let me just give you another perspective on that. Is it, you know, let me tell you what I think that this issue is really about. And when you use those bridging techniques, you'd be surprised how easy it is to move away from that negative question and move back to the question that you really want to answer, which is your position on this issue. Um, and I'll just give you some quick, uh, kind of a, a, just a little quick assortment of these bridging phrases that can help you. Number one, they help you buy time which is always helpful, you know, gives you a little time to prepare your response. But you could say something like, well, what's really important is not this so much, but this. And, and, and again, think about political debates, and you see these, these techniques in action all the time. The real issue is this. If somebody says to, to, um, to John McCain, well, you know, you yourself say you don't, much, don't know much about economic things. Well, the real issue is anybody can see that what we need is this. And so that's how you transition from what they ask you to what you want to answer. What's the real issue? That's not, this isn't my area of expertise, but this is something that I think your audience should know. 
if you start talking about statistics, you say, you know, I can't really verify those statistics. But what I can tell you from my own experience is this. Let me just add this. Let me give you a different perspective. Let me give you some history on this issue. So you can always figure out a way to bridge from the question that got asked to the question that you want to answer. And don't be afraid to do that because that's a way of not only buying time, but of giving yourself an opportunity to frame the issue in the way that you want to. Think in terms of a pyramid. And this is a really interesting visual. Okay, Visualize a pyramid. And in normal conversation, oftentimes we communicate in an inverted pyramid. That is that we kind of wander around in this broad plane. If I say to you, what's your position on the war in Iraq? Well, you know, we probably shouldn't have gotten in there initially, but now that we're there, we really shouldn't leave, and I don't know if we've really been successful. And maybe we haven't, maybe we haven't, but, you know, it has or it hasn't been a good thing, and so I guess on balance, I, I'm probably okay with it, or I'm probably opposed to it. So there's all this information, and before you finally sort of distill your thoughts, the thinking out loud process, and down here is your point. Opposite in interview situations. Interview situations, get the answer out first, and then give your documenting, your, your verification, your third-party backup, the reasons for your point. If somebody says to you, is there a pet overpopulation problem? Yeah, yeah. No. Not really. So no. it is okay to answer the question directly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if it's a question you can't answer, do so. Yeah, obviously you don't have to, you know, there's no need to fudge if you don't have to fudge. <laughs> but, but, you know, when, you know, when in doubt, a little fudging goes a long way. But no, if, you can, if, if, you're, if you're in a position where you can answer the question directly, then by all means get that answer up right away. Because here's the thing, if you've got eight to 10 second sound bite and they're editing your piece, you know, at least they've got a very clear statement of what your answer is. So if they're short of time and they asked you, is pet overpopulation a problem? And you said, absolutely not. The problem is with pet owners. That may be as much as it gets on the news, but at least you've got your position out there, and it's very clear. So think in terms of pyramids. Get your, get your answer out there first, and then do the backup. Keep your language simple. Remember we talked about no jargon, don't use the lingo, don't get technical. Keep it very simple. I had read many years ago that the average newspaper writes at the 14-year-old at the level, 8th grade level, because that is the level of understanding. You will be interested to know, that's right, you will be interested to know that that is now down to 11-year-old level, which is sixth grade. So the New York Times is telling its reporters, you write your stories for a sixth grade vocabulary. Now this shocked me until I actually was able to stay awake one night long enough to see Jay Leno do his jaywalking segment. Have you ever seen that? I tell you what, you don't want to watch that more than once a week. It's so depressing. You can't sleep, you know, because people are clueless. So, so that's why it's so important to keep your messages simple, understandable, at a very basic level in terms of vocabulary, no technical information, no jar jargon. Use those bridging techniques and repeat your key messages again and again and again. Keep coming back to those key messages. The more a reporter runs into your key messages while they're editing, the more difficult it's gonna be for him or her to edit those messages out. So keep coming back to it. If your message is there is no pet overpopulation problem, then you keep coming back to that. You keep coming back to that time and time again, so that no matter how they try to cut out that message, they really can't. Okay, now I wanna just talk very quickly about um, preparing for an interview, and preparation is really key. There is no excuse for not preparing. No excuse. Anytime I ever got cocky after doing fur industry interviews for 10 years and basically answering the same five questions for 10 years, anytime I ever got cocky and thought, I don't need to, I don't really need to prepare for that, you know, I can do this falling off a log. Every time I would say something that I was really upset with myself for saying or I would miss an opportunity. And that really is more what you're gonna do. Most of the time, you're not gonna say something really bad. Your biggest mistake is gonna be that you, you, you don't take the opportunity to say something really powerful. It's missed opportunities rather than mistakes that really do you in on these interviews. It's rare that you make a mistake that's really awful, but you miss the opportunity. So that's what you need to prepare for. You need to give yourself time to prepare. If you're at the Capitol, 
and you're just coming out of a hearing room and somebody sticks a reporter a microphone in your face and says, they just, they just voted down your position on this bill. You know, what do you have to say about that? You say, I have to go to the bathroom. Give me five minutes. Stand right here. Don't go away. I'll be right back. And then you run right down and you go to the ladies' room or the men's room and you give yourself five minutes to think about what you want to say. And you probably better go to the bathroom too because you're going to be nervous. And, uh, so, so, so you just give yourself time. There's no excuse for not taking at least five minutes. If you get a phone call from a, a radio reporter who says, you know, we just got word of such and such, so I want to put you on the phone for, for a two minute interview. Let me call you back in two minutes. I got a call on the other line. You know, I'll call you, I'll call you back in five minutes. I'll call you back in time for your deadline. Don't get caught without preparation. You can ask questions. You should ask questions before the interview. What is this interview about? What is the story angle? What kind of an angle are you doing? Who else have you interviewed? What did they say? Who else are you going to interview? Can you tell me, you know, more about what made you decide to do this story? A lot of times, you know, you'll think, oh sure, the animal rights people put them up to this, and it'll turn out to be something completely unrelated to animal rights. So you just want to know as much as you can about the reporter's perspective, why the story is being done, what the intent is. It's also, Larry, were you going to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to um, I'll tell you a little trick that I have that, that addresses that one, because I get a lot of calls. If anything that happens in the state of New Jersey that addresses an animal, my name comes up on some reporter's um, tickle file. So I have on, in my computer a whole series of little topics. And so when I get that call, I'll call you right back, and then I immediately bring up the key points, so they're right on my screen. And sometimes, if it's something I don't know a lot about, I do some Google searching and I have those pages up so that at least I can get the words out and not miss the opportunity to get the main message across. By the way, animal research saves lives. And the rest is all blah, 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 blah. Animal research saves lives. Or whatever the topic happens That's to be, right. the message is there. You see how well he knows this stuff? You should be up here. <laughs> because he's really been on the pan. So anyway, you want to ask all those questions. You want to be prepared. You want to set ground rules. When a reporter calls, you want to, you want to agree to an interview uh, at a time that's convenient for you, not only when you have time to prepare, but also at a time when you're not going to be distracted by other things going on. If you're going to have him come to your office, for example, it's probably not a, a good idea to have him come to the office when there are 50 third graders marching through the shelter, you know, taking a lesson on how to take care of their pets. So, you know, you want to make sure that the timing is conducive, not only to allow you prep time, but also to allow you to focus and devote your full attention to it. You want to do it in a controlled environment. As I said, you don't want to do it standing in front of some nut shop with a poster, you know, <laughs> behind your head saying, you know, animal researchers kill. You want to be in a controlled environment where you can control the visuals and the, and the environment so that you have, you have the maximum opportunity to focus. You want to make sure that you don't talk over long. This is a really important thing. There's no reason for a reporter to interview for any longer than about 15 minutes. <laughs> and unless they're doing a major feature story in a magazine or something, the longer you talk after 15 minutes, the more likely you are to say something that you shouldn't say and that you will regret. So make it short. Make sure that at the end of 15 minutes, you have somebody come in and say, uh, your appointment is here. Your plane is about to leave. Your mother's on the phone. Your mother's on the phone. <laughs> yeah. I think you have to go home. Your mother is calling. So, so you know, don't don't spend too much time because the more time you spend, the more dangerous it is. And see what happens is you relax, especially if a reporter is cordial and you and, and reporters know how to do this. They know how to play you. You know, we really want to get your side of the story out. You know, and so you start loosening up and you start saying things that you can't defend really when it comes right down to it. And the next thing you know, you're in big trouble. So, you know, keep it short, get your issues out, and then get them down the road. And there is no such thing as off the record. Now we all we all understand this, right? And and how many times in the last six months have we seen candidates get themselves in trouble over hot mics? Okay. They never learn. That's right. They're not educable. Uh, so, you know, I don't need to belabor that. When you're done, shut the hell up. Just shut up. Don't say anything more. Because, you know, you don't want to take any risk. When you're done, you're done. And, you know, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll say, you, you know, you answer the question and they'll say, um, like this. And they'll just leave that microphone in your face. 
for another 30 seconds. And you feel as though, oh, I must not be done. I guess they want me to say something else. Well, they can leave that microphone there until their arm falls off. But if you don't want to say anything else, you know, you don't have to say anything else. And most of the time, you're better off not. So don't feel compelled to keep talking just because the microphone is still there. It's not a vacuum. It can't pull words out of your mouth if you don't let them come out. <laughs> so when you're done, you're done. So now you've, um, you've established your key messages. You've figured out that you want to not only tell why you're the good guys, but why the other guys are maybe a little bit off-center. You're going to focus on these messages. You're going to keep coming back to them. You're going you're gonna to use moderate, reasonable, responsible, middle-of-the-road language because that's where the public is. You're going to prepare well. You're going to set your ground rules in advance. You're going to fix those communication messages in your mind so that they don't get lost. You want to establish credibility. We talked about this earlier. Let people know what your qualifications are. That's information that you can give a reporter often before you start the interview. You can just say, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years, and I've got this credential and this credential. I'm active in my national associations. All that gives you credibility. Whenever possible, you're going to back up those messages with, with statistics, with examples. Using examples is really important because a lot of times we're talking about sort of abstract concepts here. Uh, the, the whole relationship between people and animals and the way people perceive animals is a very sort of ephemeral, ethereal, um, complicated thing. So sometimes we have to recognize that um, the best way to describe what we're talking about is example. For example, when, when you've got all these people who believe that the PETAs and the HSUS type organizations of the world, these are all about animal welfare. You say, you know, you may not be aware of it, but but, you know, PETA has a, a statement on companion animals that basically says, you know, animals shouldn't be pets, that we are imprisoning them by making them pets, and that they should be free to live their lives in the wild. Except that they get to kill 97% of them. Right. <laughs> but you can say, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, if I left my pet outside for 24 hours, that poor little critter would not be doing well. You know? And people understand that. They may not understand all this you know, philosophical discussion about the role of animals, but they understand when you say, would you leave your pet out, you know, free to enjoy their life in the wild, competing in the environment for food, and hoping that they don't get you know, eaten up by something bigger? I don't think so, yeah. The other thing is if you leave your pet out for 24 hours in many jurisdictions, they'll be charged with animal abuse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, if it's a violation of law, all the better, but, um, but, but what I'm saying is it's just important to sort of let people relate to these things on a personal way, and using personal examples and analogies is, is a good way to do that. Um, I'd just like to say that when you're, when you're I, I'm not an expert at this, but when you're citing your qualifications, finishing eight champions and, and winning at your national specialty is generally not impressive to anybody. <laughs> That's so right. And I have heard so many breeders, you know, what, what they should say is, you know, I've, I've been breeding for 30 years, I love my dogs, right. my life is my dogs, and all they can do is talk about how many champions they've finished and all that. Yeah. Unless you won Westminster, they don't That's care. right. That, that, that's, that is so true. Nobody really cares about that. And that's, and that's where it really comes into, you know, play the whole issue of knowing your audience. Recognize what's important to your audience is they don't care how many prizes you won. You know, what they care about is you love animals and you've spent your life raising animals and so they can relate to you because they love animals and they've spent a lot of time raising Fido. Yeah. Well, I think on 8634, one of the things that truly resonated for the legislators was something that I'd really like Laura to address and that was what, what the bill meant, not, not to the shelter population, but to the search and rescue dogs, the, the herding dogs that would be lost, Police dogs that would be lost. I mean, <coughs> has the most wonderful website that covered all of those issues, and that really resonated with the, uh, with right. the legislators because that, as many other people have said, these are people issues, and they understood what the bill would mean when they when they realized that they were going to be missing dogs that were very important to society. Right. And so you know, CFA got right into helping to create and produce. TV commercials to get that point across. Because yep. we want to win that bill. And the whole commercials were all about dogs. And I went to her website and I never learned so much about police dogs. And <laughs> well, and that's, how, and, and that's absolutely it. And that's what we mean when we say speak in terms of the impact on your audience. Yeah. 
It's all about how it affects the people that are listening. And animals are part of that, of the community. Right, right, right. But if people understand how it affects them, that's where you get them where they live. That's where you get them where they live. Yes? Um, they were, I was on Nova, which was a terrifying experience. <laughs> and um, if it wasn't for Patty, I think it would have been a total disaster. Because uh, when they called me up, they wanted to come over and start filming. And I said, no. You can come over and meet me and meet my dog. And they came over and they said, you know, what they wanted to do, which is they wanted me to take a picture of me washing the dog. And I said, no, can't take a picture of me washing my dog. <laughs> Why do you want to take a picture? I'm a purebred dog reader. I'm proud of what I do. I mean, I'm a judge. Uh, my whole life is dedicated to dog and dogs, and you want to take a picture of me giving a dog a bath. I said, go to a groomer. <laughs> and Patty said, don't give them a sound bite. And I was terrified. I was totally terrified. Don't give them a sound bite. And then as we were doing this, I gave them a sound bite and I thought, oh my God, Patty's looking over my shoulder. I said, if you put that on tape, I will come after you in the night and kill you. There's a sound bite. There's a sound bite. There's a sound bite. There's a sound bite. that I hadn't considered. <laughs> but times are changing. You know. Well, you've considered, you just haven't verbalized. Right now, please. And I'm not signing a release. That's it. Well, one would hope that, you know, media would be a little bit more respectful. And that's one of the problems that you have with media. Is sometimes they have a very arrogant attitude. And it's very difficult not to... Um, be aggravated by that, not to let your resentment of that show. And Mark was talking earlier about, you know, if you don't like politics and you don't like politicians, then stay stay away from the Capitol. And and um, I think that, that many of us, after many, many years of dealing with reporters, reach a point where sometimes we're not very good at dealing with reporters because we have a very low level of tolerance, which is why I do more consulting and advising now than actually one-on-one -on -one media relations. And I advise my clients that, that it really is more important for the messages to come from them and, and really, it's true because nobody wants to talk to a hired gun, and that's how somebody like like me would be perceived. I'm a hired gun, but people want to talk. The media want to talk to people who are actually in the industry, working hands on. So that's why I train people. And you will all go home, and you will do the work of the Lord, and you will speak, <laughs> and you will speak to reporters, and I'll be drinking beer, watching television. <laughs> It's a personal decision. 
So I would not presume to generalize about any group and what they think about these issues. I would just say it's personal. We all have our own perspective. To Charlotte's point about signing the release, if we are doing interviews or newspaper articles or so forth, what kind of things should we expect uh, from a control standpoint, should we have to sign a release? Do Normally for that? news you don't. Um, the only time that you would be asked to sign a release would be if somebody was producing a video program or you know, a feature story uh, that was going to be aired as, as sort of in and of itself, not a newscast. But for news, they, you know, they don't need to have you sign a release. <laughs> Obviously the fact that you're participating is implicit release. Um, so to that extent, you've given you know, you've given your release just by the fact that you're there participating in the interview. But you do have the control that I mentioned earlier in terms of deciding when you're going to talk, where you're going to talk, how long you're going to talk, and what subjects you're going to talk about. You can say to somebody, look, if you want to talk about this issue, if you want to talk about statistics, I'm the wrong person to ask those questions because I really don't have a lot of statistics. I'm not a numbers person. I can tell you who is a good numbers person, and here's their phone number, and here's their email address, and they'll give you the numbers that you need. But you know, if you want to talk to them about that, talk to them. I'm not your person. So be, be honest about that and be upfront. A lot of times you can get yourself off the hook by just saying, you know, I'm really not the person you should talk to. Buck passing is a very good thing. <laughs> Pass the buck, yes. Uh, speaking to releases, I just want to caution on one thing. Um, we get calls a lot. We own a large training and boarding facility. And we had to go and add in our our contract for people that are boarding their dogs with us, that uh, we had to actually put a line in there for a release case uh, news people or somebody came through and filmed in the kennel for any reason, uh, because we got into big trouble because they had come in and filmed something, and then there was all these dogs that nobody could identify who they belong to. So every person that boards at our kennel, in the contract that they sign, it says all the other stuff that we're not reliable for this and that. <laughs> Basically, there's a line right in that says that uh, at times there's going to be video yeah, that can work both ways. There was a lady here. Okay, good. I was just going to address it. I was a news producer for two years for a TV station. My reporters were under strict orders, either a written release or you take the person on camera, really giving permission for them to be put on the air. We had to have something. Our right. legal department required it. Right, and in, in most cases, in most cases, uh, in my experience, I've never been asked to sign a release for a news interview. But as you say, your participation in front of the camera is your implicit consent. Yes, sir. Uh, one thing I would suggest, and maybe NAIA could make itself available, is that when you're going to write an article or, or give an interview and ask to do that, share what you're about to do with somebody else. You know, I've done this with the AKC with my All Read Club. Because I think what that does is not only help you fine-tune your message, but also to develop a consistent message that we would all be given throughout all parts of the country. And I think in the eye, would be a good source of, Absolutely. you know, for that kind of activity. Right. Okay. I think that's a great suggestion. And I think it's also smart to, to, to um, sit down with somebody else if you have some prep time. Sit down with somebody else and go through the questions that you're likely to ask. And imagine, like, like Mark was saying, imagine the toughest questions you're going to get. And and de and develop your answer based on the toughest questions that you're going to get. I think we've run out of time. Oh, what gave that away? <laughs> <laughs> There's this antsy lady in a pink jacket up there, sort of giving me the evil eye. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. That concludes this wonderful two-day seminar. I personally would like to give a special thanks to, to Patty, who is currently
and your financial support. Last night's auction was a huge success, and we thank all the members of the South Windsor Kennel Club and the Wyndham County Kennel Club and Connecticut Dog Federation, Farmington Kennel Club, Mass Fed for, for being here, participating, helping us put this together. But you are the most important element for our success. And uh, we thank you. We would also like to say that we look forward to seeing you again next year in Washington, D.C. Those are, the plans are, are in the works. We don't have a date yet. But I want to leave you with this thought. If NAIA had a fraction of the income revenue that HSUS has, think of the message that we could deliver. We would be framing the debate in a whole different way. So just keep that in mind and uh, thank you for all for coming. Thank you.